Okay, um, Providencing Balkan Obsidian, or Bulgarian Obsidian. Uh, Robert has already got over some of this. Um, these are, okay, here is Bulgaria. For those who know, um, these are the closest uh, obsidian sources, uh, distance wise, to Bulgaria. Now, of course, the goal of uh, provenance ink is to match obsidian artifacts to specific geological sources. And we can do that uh, to some extent macroscopically, as Robert pointed out, you do get uh, microscopic differences between obsidian, but very much easier with geochemical fingerprinting. And there are lots of techniques, uh, um, laboratory-based techniques like neutron activation, ICPMS, but also increasingly, uh, for geochemical printing, uh, fingerprinting, um, we have handheld PXRF, portable XRF. And it has lots of advantages, already mentioned by Robert. There they are. Um, there are lots of instruments on the market uh, that are capable of doing this. Robert uses a Brooker tracer. Uh, I use a Niton XL3T Ultra. Uh, other people use other instruments. They all have similar capabilities. They're all capable of uh, uh, recording uh, measurements on uh, elements in the periodic table between magnesium at the light end and uranium at the heavy end. And they give you similar detection limits, limits of detection, LOD. Um, there has been some criticism in the literature of PXRF. Uh, it's claimed not to be uh, particularly accurate. Um, it is accurate um, in the sense that it gives you values, uh, elemental concentrations that are internally consistent. Uh, it depends what you want. Uh, what are the goals? What are the goals of obsidian uh, PXRF analysis? Um, that depends really on what you want. Do you want precise elemental concentrations, or do you simply want the right answer? You simply want to be able to match your artifacts to uh, the geological source. Um, now, it's possible to match artifacts to geological sources um, if you use the same instrument for measuring the artifacts and the geological sources. If you don't have that possibility, then you need to do calibration. Uh, you need to calibrate your instrument uh, for looking at obsidian, because instruments don't necessarily come uh, with an obsidian calibration. The Bruker does, the Niton doesn't. But this shows you, you what happens if you have a, an instrument that's calibrated for obsidian and one that isn't. So the blue dots were measurements that I took with the Bruker tracer some years ago, uh, and the brown dots with the, the Niton XL3T. So you get different elemental concentrations because one is calibrated for obsidian, the other isn't. But you get the same answer. It's still, reported, it's still showing you you've got two groups on it. And it's fairly easy to do the calibration. It's basically regression analysis. You take a series of measurements on uh, geological reference samples. I took a load of uh, not necessarily obsidian, but various kinds of rocks, uh, 25 or so. I measured them with my instrument, compared the measurements against the, the known values. And by regression analysis, you derive a calibration factor that you can feed into your instrument or you can apply for the measurements that come out of the instrument. So you can convert the measurements that come out of the instrument into uh, elemental, precise elemental concentrations. Now, coming to the, the Bulgarian sites, um, so we have, uh, we have to say, obsidian is quite scarce on Bulgarian prehistoric sites. There are just at the present time, four sites that we know of, prehistoric sites with obsidian artifacts. And these are these sites here. So we have three sites in northern Bulgaria on the southern edge of the Danube Plain. But looking at them chronologically, we have three early Neolithic sites Ahoden in northwestern Bulgaria, Julianitsa in north central Bulgaria, and Jaman down here in the southwest on the edge of the Rodope Mountains. 
And then we have a rather later site, a millennium later, we have, of course, the famous uh, cemetery sites at Varna on the Black Sea coast. And so those are the four locations from which we have archaeological obsidian. And this is the sum total, or was the sum total, of obsidian artifacts from Bulgaria uh, at the time I did these analyses. So we've got the huge collection up here from uh, Ahu. We've got the one piece from German, and the two pieces from Julianitsa, and the two pieces from Barnum. You may see some typological differences there, which we'll come back to. German, uh, down in the stream of Ami, but on the edge of the Rabadope Mountains, is a rescue excavation by Georgi Ivanov. Uh, interesting site, it has an early Neolithic and uh, early Iron Age occupations. Uh, the early Neolithic features at this site are buried beneath uh, natural uh, debris flows. And the one obsidian artifact from uh, German uh, was associated with one of these early Neolithic features. And uh, Maria uh, has done a useware analysis uh, of the single artifact. There is useware on the piece. And Maria tells me that this mat, this is counterintuitive, this mat, brown, this mat, stripe along the edge. It's actually sickle gloss. If it was on a flint artifact, it would be nice and glossy. On an obsidian artifact, it comes out as a matte band. Interesting feature. Uh, Houghton, up in the, the northwest, uh, excavated by George Gimitsovsky, uh, is in a little tributary valley, um, nice fertile valley. Uh, it has several, according to the excavator, several phases of the early Neolithic occupation beginning with what is called proto starchivo so supposedly a very early starchivo event. No radiocarbon, well, I think one radiocarbon date uh, published from this site. So we don't know very much about the chronology of these phases, but there are obsidian artifacts from all the excavators recognised phases. Julianitsa in north-central Bulgaria is uh, very different. The site is up here uh, somewhere. And this is a site with a very large series of radiocarbon dates, so it's one of the earliest Neolithic sites that we have in Bulgaria, with dates ranging from just over 6,000 Cal BC to 5,900 for phases 1 and 2. And the two artifacts, obsidian artifacts, that we have from Julianitsa are assigned to those uh, phases 1 and 2, but they don't come from specific archaeological features. And of course, the Varna Cemetery needs no introduction, uh, very rich in terms of gold and copper artifacts. Uh, the obsidian artifacts came from, well, one came from Burial 41, which is a pit containing a large number of special objects, including gold objects. No human remains, but it's interpreted as a cenotaph, um, a burial place denoting a person who died somewhere else. And the other find from uh, Varna is a more recent find discovered during construction works much more recently uh, with uh, a series of copper artifacts, a large uh, flint blade and a smaller obsidian blade. And the excavator compares this, or the uh, even of, uh, sorry, Slavja, uh, compares this to uh, Burial 43 Varna. It says the uh, assemblage is very similar to Burial 43. Uh, which is dated to just over 4,500 Cal BC. Now, what did PXRF analysis of this uh, material show? Well, the Bulgarian sites, as you can see, are more or less equidistant from these sources, so in, just in purely distance terms, uh, you know, obsidian has to travel a similar distance whichever source it comes from. Um, we know that the central Mediterranean obsidian, which wasn't really used before the Neolithic, finds its way along the, uh, the Dalmatian and Adriatic coast of the Balkans, uh, but it doesn't really get much beyond that. Uh, there, to my knowledge, have been no claims of Anatolian obsidian uh, in the Balkans, north of the Aegean. So it really comes down to a choice between uh, the Aegean sources and the Carpathian sources. And among Bulgarian archaeologists, of course, uh, there has been quite a bit of discussion as to whether there is Melian obsidian uh, in Romanian sites. That's another story. So, okay, if we just consider as uh, people who do obsidian characterization, we tend to focus initially on these three elements, rubidium, strontium, uh, zirconium. 
Uh, these, measured with my instrument, are the ranges uh, that we would expect for Carpathian obsidian, and there are three main sources of Carpathian obsidian, one in Slovakia, C1, one in Hungary, C2, and one in Ukraine, which seems not to have been used very widely, uh, uh, C3. But those are the ranges, and that's how Melos compares. So they're more or less distinguishable on the basis of those three elements. Now, how do our Bulgarian finds fit into that? Well, clearly, they fall, they correspond to two different source groups. Uh, and there's a series of them that obviously relate to Carpathian I from Slovakia, and another group uh, which, come, which corresponds to Carpathian II, and specifically 2E uh, from Hungary. If we look at the sites individually, uh, the two pieces from Varna uh, fall clearly within the Carpathian I range. Now that's no big surprise because Varna, just as German, uh, these are nice blades, right? which you don't see in Julianitsa and you don't see the Hoja. So it's no surprise that they're using Carpathian I because Carpathian I. Uh, would I say it's the best quality of obsidian in the Carpathians? Possibly it is, but it's the, the source that tends to provide, or did tend to provide in prehistory, the biggest pieces. And so you can see uh, the Neologus uh, Horde from Hungary, uh, you know, nice big blade course. Uh, Pierre Allard has, um, uh, if you go and see his poster, you will see uh, the material he's been working on in Slovakia. Again, Carpathian I. So there's no surprise that our blades are coming from the Carpathian I source. A look at the early Neolithic sites. We've got German, which is uh, the, only, the two pieces from there come from Carpathian II. Uh, sorry, Jimmy, it's uh, Carpathian II. And German is Carpathian I. And that's uh, a blade segment. And the Hoden, uh, which is our biggest sample, of course. Uh, and it was using material from both sources. So what are the conclusions of all this? Well, this has been, I think, the first provenancing study in Bulgaria and obsidian. Not saying a great deal, these are fairly recent finds. Um, all the known finds appear to derive from sources in the Carpathians. Uh, Carpathian I uh, seems to have been exploited for blades. Uh, and Carpathian 1 and 2 obsidian, uh, Slovakian and Hungarian obsidian, were both exploited in the early Neolithic. What we can't say at the moment is whether there was a temporal shift within the early Neolithic. Did people start using Carpathian 2 and then switch to Carpathian 1? We don't know. It's too, too small a sample uh, and not enough radiocarbon dated features with obsidian. But certainly when you get into the late Neolithic and the Calcolithic, uh, in the Balkans, it's nearly all Carpathian 1 which is being used. Carpathian 2 doesn't figure very much anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs>